Okay, so the, uh, the series Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day. Lesson four, the ideal uh, woman or what to look for in a woman. And we'll be looking at Proverbs 31 as far as that is concerned. If you would look at the covers, you know, you go into the store, especially at the airport, that's where they really got them displayed. If you would look at the covers of popular women's magazines, uh, you would soon discover what qualities are being promoted for the ideal woman of the early 21st century. She is uh, relaxed in manner and dress, uh, healthy, body, healthy mind. Um, she's independent, even if she's married, she's independent. Uh, she's aware and involved in what's going on around her. Uh, the ideal woman is making a place for herself in the, in the world. This is what we hold up as the ideal for women uh, today. These are the catchwords. Uh, for the ideal woman. Um, as a comparison to this particular woman, uh, I'd like to describe the portrait of an ideal woman given to us in the Bible that's 3,000 years old. Just to compare it to this one here. This is not an exhaustive description about women, so you, know, you, you couldn't do all of that in just a, a simple 30 minute uh, lesson. Um, but it's a sketch. It's a sketch of an image of the kind of woman that is pleasing to God and to man and uh, is still relevant today, I, I believe anyways. So the description of the uh, ideal woman, Proverbs uh, 31 uh, verses 10 to 31 uh, is at the end of the book of Proverbs. It's a beautiful acrostic poem extolling the virtues of an ideal woman. Acrostic poems are those where each line of poetry begins with the subsequent letter of the alphabet. For example, if it was a poem in English, the first line of the poem would start with the letter A, and then the second line with the letter B, and the third line with the letter C, and all the way down to the, to the end. In Hebrew, there are only 22 letters in the alphabet. So the poem has, you know, if it has 22 lines, it has the subsequent letters of the Hebrew al uh, alphabet. Anyways, in this poem, the writer begins his description by saying one thing about what he calls the virtuous woman. And he says, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above, far above jewels. In other words, he's saying the excellent woman, the vir virtuous woman, he says she's rare. She's rare. Not every woman is like this, he says, just like not every piece of jewelry is precious. Pearls are precious because they're rare and they're hard to find. I mean, all jewelry shines, but not all jewelry is precious. And he's saying that basically about about women. A virtuous woman, one that has inner strength, he says, is hard to find, even harder to find than precious jewels. So precious jewelry, not easy to find, he says, but a virtuous woman, even more difficult. So what makes her more valuable? He explains. He says, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. And so the writer summarizes her value in describing her relationship to her husband. In other words, she's trustworthy. That's what makes her so valuable. The author tells us that the innate quality that this woman possesses is her trustworthiness. Now, not just to her husband, but as an essential quality that she has as a person. So with or without a husband, she's trustworthy. That's the thing that makes her precious. And he says, when you have found a woman like this, you have found a precious stone. 
So in the following verses, the author is going to go on to describe the outward signs that reveal this precious inward quality of trustworthiness. You know, you, you meet someone, uh, a woman in this case, I mean, it isn't stamped on her forehead, you know, trustworthy. It's an inner quality, but there's things on the outside that point to that on the inside, and that's what he's going to talk about in the context of a married woman. This isn't the only context, but for this time and for this place, he describes the qualities of the married woman that point to her inner trust worthiness. So he starts by saying she's a good manager and a hard worker. So the author gives several examples of this first quality. He says, first of all, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. In other words, she's a cheerful worker. She's cheerful in her work. She doesn't complain or see her work as a burden, as a drudge. Verse 14, he says, she is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. We would say she uses imagination in preparing food and is a wise shopper, careful with her, with her money. She manages her responsibilities well in her home. He says she rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. In other words, she's on top of the situation concerning her affairs. Yes, you know, she manages a home, but she manages that home. She knows what's going on. She's about her business. He says in verses 16, and then I'm jumping around here to keep the ideas together. He says, she considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Then in verse 24, he says, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. So she has good business sense and she knows how to turn a profit. Without sacrificing her home, she's able to use her business talents to the advantage of her home. She doesn't uh, neglect her home with outside work. She builds her home with the outside work uh, that she does. He says she's not afraid of hard work and doesn't waste her time at home. This is a woman who knows the difference between leisure and laziness. Verse 17, she says she girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. And of course, that's of course working at home. She demonstrates that a well-managed home is a profitable enterprise. She understands that time is money. You know, not just in business that time is money, not just you know, at work or at the factory or wherever you are, time is money. Time is money at home as well. And she uses her time at home uh, profitably. I've always said that a well-managed home is like a second salary. A lot of people think, oh, I've got, I've, got to, I've got to leave the house and get a job in order to have you know, extra income. But if the home is well managed, it's like a second income. When you calculate all the money it costs to work, a lot of times, you know, it, especially when you've got little kids at home and you have to pay to have them taken care of and pay for this and pay for that. By the time you subtract all the expenses for you to go out to work, it's almost not worth the money. Not in every situation, of course, but I know a lot of women who have said this very thing. You know, I'm working, but I, you know, there's not much left. In verse 21, 23, he says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the, uh, of the land. So by her work at home, she contributes to her family's and her husband's reputation in the community. Her children are clean, they're well-fed, they're mannered, 
They're well dressed and her husband is also. And that is a reflection of their home of which she is the manager. If marriage is a partnership, the woman that the author describes here is a good partner to have. I want, I want that partner. I mean, in real life, I think I have that partner, but I'm saying if I were looking for a partner in life, this is the one I'd be shooting for. So in describing the outward signs that point to the inward quality of the ideal woman, the author begins by describing the things that make her a good manager and a, and a hard worker. He continues uh, by uh, talking about another outward sign that points to her inward virtuousness, and that is she has a good character and a good reputation within her community. And he goes on to say four things about her character. First of all, he says, she extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. So she's kind and generous. James, in the book of James, tells us that benevolence to the poor and homeless is a sign of true piety, James 1.27. So this woman here is truly a spiritual woman with a godly character. Verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing and she smiles at the future. I love that expression, she smiles at the future. In other words, this is a woman who has confidence. She's not afraid of the future, the near future or the far future because her faith and her good works cover her with honor and power. Good works are empowering. She's a person who's at ease in her conscience because her heart and her hands are busy doing what is right. She's not guilt-ridden or depressed because she's busy giving herself away to others, especially to the ones that she, that she loves. He says also that she is wise. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Her tongue is not for gossip, but rather for edification. This is one of my own, when she was alive, I used to say one of my own mother, my mother, Jane, was one of her qualities. She never spoke ill of other people. And brother, she had, a, she had opportunity, she had cause. I, I, want to, I don't want to go into all the family stuff, you know, but oh, wow. I used to say, mom, how could you put up with that? I said, well, how could she say that about you or do that to you, blah, blah, blah. And I, I couldn't shake her. You know, I said, well, you know, some people have had hard lives and you know, it, it's not easy for them. You know, she would never, never speak ill of other people. Myself, personally, that never held me back. You know, but she, uh, <laughs> she, had a, she had a wonderful quality like that. And I've also found that in my own wife has that wonderful quality as well. So both never use their words to destroy, always to build others up, beginning with myself and our children at home. This is wisdom from above and the woman of the poem demonstrates that, well, she has this kind of wisdom. In verse 27, he says, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. In other words, she's concerned, but her first and primary concern is her home and her family. There's a difference between concern and worry. Concern is you're looking at all the factors, you're looking at what's going on, you're paying attention. Little Jimmy, you know, he's got the sniffles, I need to keep an eye on him you know, because there's a thing going around. You know? She's not worried about Jimmy, but she's concerned about little Jimmy. Uh, there's water, there's moisture kind of building up over here. She's not, well, oh, no, we, well, we can't afford a new roof. You know, you know. She's not worried, she's concerned, she's paying attention. I need to talk to Joe, her husband, you know, when he comes home, I need to talk to him about that. So we can kind of nip that in the bud, you know, and not make it something that will become expensive. The difference between worry and concern. Um, she is aware of the needs of her family and the community and she's concerned about fulfilling them using all of her skills and qualities refined through years of service and, and practice. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 3 rather, that the man is the head of the woman and consequently the head of the home. But the writer here in Proverbs 31, 31, he balances out this picture by showing us that the woman is the heart of the home. You know, the, man may, the man may be the head of the home, but the woman is the, is the heart of the home. And when the head and the heart are in union with Christ as the Lord of the home, what a wonderful place that home is or can be. And so in the last couple of verses, the author describes the rewards awaiting such a person and clear signs that she is a virtuous woman. She has this, you know, this trustworthiness demonstrated by good stewardship of her home and a godly character. And these two things, they bring her rewards. Well, what rewards are they? Well, first of all, it's praise. Praise from her family. Verse 28 and nine, her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. So her children are thankful that they have a mother like her. I mean, what a reward for a mother to have grateful children. If you don't think so, try living with ungrateful children. Children who are young adults, who do not recognize the sacrifices that their mother has made on their behalf and are ungrateful. That is a terrible burden um, to carry. Let's face it, as children, we have forgotten the things that our parents have done for us because we've, I forgot, you know, how can I remember what happened when I was eight months old? How can I remember how long my mother, how many nights of sleep she lost because I was sick or whatever, you know, I, whatever. Uh, all of those things in my mind are completely forgotten. I only start having a bit of a memory of my childhood. You know, you were what, three, four, five years old or something, you start remembering stuff. So when your own children praise you, this is, a, this is a great reward. And then her husband sees her as the best of all women. And of course, the, you know, that he mentions her husband in this way, this suggests his absolute fidelity and devotion as well. And so she has the praise of her family, the appreciation of her family, and she has the support and the devotion and the fidelity of her husband. These are wonderful lifetime rewards that you can't get in, in, in other ways. And then he also says that her community, in a sense, praises her. He says, give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. In the gates, you know, that's where the city council would be. Uh, it's a, a reference to the, to the community. So her neighbors and her friends and her community see her as a woman of value and a woman of character. So in the end, the author summarizes the true essence and value of this person in verse 30. He says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Her motivating factors are not beauty or charm, uh, not social climbing. Uh, she's a person that fears, or if you wish, respects or obeys the Lord, this is what motivates her. Her desire to work well, to serve others, to develop a good character, all of these are inspired by her basic faith and desire to obey God, who wants all of his daughters to become women of value and women of virtue. Now, I want you to notice some of the things that were not mentioned here, things that were not mentioned about this woman. First of all, her looks. There's no mention of her looks. Her skin, her hair, her weight, her height, her figure. We don't know. Was she tall or short? Was she you know, overweight, underweight? Was she, was she beautiful or homely? Was she handicapped in a way? You know, did she stutter? Was she blind in one eye? Did she, did, she, did she have crippling arthritis in one eye? We don't know. We have no idea. There's no description of that whatsoever. 
Another thing that's not described is her independence. What degree of independence that she has. So important to today's woman. I mean, for this woman in this poem here, that's not even a question. It's not something that even comes up. It wasn't about her independence. It was about the people who depended on her. That's what she thought about. And also notice, it doesn't talk at all about her quote, her knowledge, her education. Was she a very educated woman? Was she not? I mean, did she have formal training of some kind? Nope. These were not mentioned, not because they're not in themselves important, but rather because they did not make her more valuable one way or another. Would she have been more valuable had the writer said she was very beautiful or she was not very beautiful? Would that have changed her value as an individual? No. Notice, however, what was mentioned as important. Her work concerning her responsibility towards her husband and family and community. In New Testament times, we talk about the community, the church. That's her immediate community. Her attitude of kindness and wisdom, that was important to mention. Her confidence and lack of guilt. I love this idea, she smiles at the future. She smiles at the future, I mean, she's not worried about the future. And her reward of praise from three groups that she serves, her family, her community, and of course, God himself who praises her because if you think about it for a moment, he's the one that wrote this poem. He's the one that wrote this poem about the virtuous, the virtuous woman. So you know, we, we have extremes in recognizing women in our society today. You know, either we have a day that honors only those women that have children, you know, Mother's Day, or the various organizations that promote those women who see themselves as feminists. You know, it's like, it's like extremes, extremes. I, I want to encourage those women who work hard in raising children, but I want to also include all those women who are striving to become women of valor in our society, regardless of their status. And who are these women? in our day and age. Who are the women that are striving for this? They're out there. Remember I ended my, my, my lesson last week about what to look for in a man, you know, and I said, these men that I just described, they're out there. They're tall, they're short, they're big, they're fat, they're whatever, you know, but they're out there, these men, these men that you ought to be. Well, these women of valor, they're out there. Absolutely. They're out there. They're, they're out there because they are the women who are resisting the pressure from the media and society to work only on the outward beauty, but through patient obedience to Jesus Christ, they're also creating a beautiful inward person. And I'm not saying that as a cliche. It's almost, uh, it's almost uh, the punchline to a joke. You know, I, oh, I want to set you up on a blind date. Really, you know, what does she look like? Well, of course, remember I said, the first thing we look for are looks. You know, what does she look like? Well, she has a, she's, she's a good person. Yeah, yeah, but what does she look like? Oh, she, but she has a beautiful inward person. Yeah, yeah, but what does she look like? And we use that as a joke, but it's not a joke. It's not a joke. I would say to that young man, if the only thing that the guy says about your blind date is that she's a looker, but nothing else, be careful. <laughs> because if that's the only thing that she has to commend herself, maybe that thing won't go very far. Of course, we, we want to be attractive to other people, but we also want to be attractive to God. And the attraction that lasts a lifetime, we know this, is the attraction that we have from within and not just without. Because looks, let's face it, we all know it, right? Looks, looks, I love to, when I visit folks, little older folks, older than me, I ask them you know, to show me their wedding picture or show me a picture of, a, I saw a lady, Linda Hall, wonderful woman, she and her husband were like pioneers in the uh, sojourner movement, you know. And uh, 
uh, Marvin and Linda Hall, yeah. And Linda Hall passed away last week. She was 95 years old. And I saw her last year, believe it or not, when I was in California. And you know, hi, Miss Linda, how are you? And she was very frail in a wheelchair. But she, she knew who I was. She was still, you know. And she passed away. Well, I knew Linda Hall like only when she was like eight. She was 80 or something, you know. And there was a picture of her, picture of her when she was 20. That's the picture they showed you know, in the obituary. And what a lovely woman she was. But I, you know, I never could see that because all I saw was a very frail old woman in a, in a wheelchair. And it reminded me once again, yeah, we all have looks at one point in our life. You know, we, we've all been good looking one time or another. You know what I'm saying? But the things we're talking about here, those things, they last. They last beyond the time when our looks fail us. So these women I'm talking about, they're out there. They're resisting the pressure of the world to only work on the outside. Uh, women who in a thousand ways every day serve their husbands and or their families, their church, their school, their community, and they do it with a smile, and they do it sincerely, and they do it with diligence. What was the thing that the servant saw uh, in Rachel when he was searching for a wife uh, for Jacob, right? What was the thing that, that amazed him? What was the thing that he asked God? Did he say, okay, God, show me the looker. I'm looking for the looker here, because my boss, you know, he, didn't, he didn't want me to bring home somebody who's ugly. What was the condition, he said? The one that comes and offers me water and, and, and you know, gives me water and, and does what else? and takes care of my camel and my animals and my men. In other words, the one that comes by and offers us service. And if you read that passage, you notice that she served them eagerly. She was happy to do it. Yes, my Lord, she said, I'm happy to serve you and let me get this for your animals and so on and so forth. So those women are out there able to serve with a smile and sincerity and uh, del diligence. Uh, women whose strongest desire is not to be free and independent, but rather desire to be useful and kind and generous to those who are in need. What a marvelous quality that is. And of course, uh, women who are keeping themselves pure sexually and ready for the, not ready just for marriage, if that's what we're talking about, but also ready for the return of the Lord ready for the return of the Lord. I tell people, who told you that, you know, especially young unmarried people, who told you that you're going to get married before Jesus returns? <laughs> Maybe he'll come back before you have a chance to get married. Won't you be happy that you've prepared yourself not only for marriage, but you've prepared yourself for him? So we have, we have many such women of course, they're out there, but they're in our congregation as well. And uh, our young men you know, should take careful note of, uh, of this lesson and review it seriously, because I think a lot of times their criteria for finding wives is based more on worldly ideas hatched in Hollywood than godly ideas found in scripture. You know, it's the scripture that, that teaches us how to stay married for life. Hollywood, I mean, I use that as a catchphrase for you know, pop culture. Hollywood never teaches us how to stay married for life. That's not, the, that's not the message. So for these women here, whether they are married or widowed or they're single or they're unmarried or they have children or they have no children, I pray that God will bless you as true women of valor. And I also pray that as the precious jewels that you are, you will shine forth among all others and receive the reward of praise that you so richly deserve for being Christian women of valor. That is a, that is a valid objective to shoot for and one that brings reward. Okay, so those are some comments about you know, what to look for in a, uh, in a woman and certainly what to strive for as a woman. And if you're a man that has a relationship with a woman, how to encourage her 
uh, as a wife or as a friend or as a sister. All right, that's our lesson for now. We're going to shut it down.